All right, thank you guys for uh, being here. Thank you for continuing the day with us as we promote solidarity um, in mental health, as we try to see where social justice and mental health intersect. And right now we have a, a very, very exciting part of the day. This is super important to us. Uh, our chairperson, Ms. Janine, she went to great length to ensure that we have a, a substantial panel for you as we move into this panel discussion. Uh, so I will introduce your panelists. They're looking so bright and smart and stuff. <laughs> right, because they are, there we go. Um, and then I'll introduce uh, the person who will be running this panel discussion. I know you guys are heartbroken. It's not gonna be me. It's gonna be somebody else. Uh, let's start with, uh, and as I introduce you, if you please, panelists, could you just uh, indicate by raise of hands. Uh, we'll start with Daisy Ozean. She is the director of, she's the director of Resilient Wellness, a public health system designed to address intergenerational trauma. She's also on the Alameda County Public Health Commission. Then we have Dr. Zaya Malawa, MD, and PH, there you go. Uh, she's a pediatrician and public health professional committed to improving health outcomes for children and families of color. She currently sees patients at Mission Neighborhood Health Center and works for the San Francisco Department of Public Health, leading a collective impact initiative to reduce racial disparities in birth outcomes. Then we have Paul Kialoa Blake, Paul Kialoa Blake. Oh, you're welcome. You're welcome, Paul. Uh, he uh, is a part of Copwatch East Bay Medical Center and is the chair of Berkeley Homeless Commission. He's the former chair and current commissioner of Berkeley Mental Health Commission. Uh, Berkeley Copwatch is based on the idea that watching the police is a crucial first step in the process of organizing. We do not attempt or they do not attempt to interfere with police activity or resist um, police misconduct physically. However, uh, by you know paying attention to what the police uh, does, they think that that will cause some um, change in just the, the the level of police brutality, especially along race lines. Then we have then we have Dr. Siri Brown. She's our vice chancellor. <laughs> yeah, I'm trying to graduate, guys. Uh, <laughs> her strong educational background in African African American history prompted her to earn a doctorate as a historian of African studies. She's also a community activist and educator at the local community colleges and the University of California. In and outside of her classroom, she stresses the importance of knowing your history, especially for people from black and brown communities. Anyone who has spent even a little bit, as we say in Jamaica, a little bit of time with Dr. Siri knows her commitment that she will stop at nothing to help her students and those in her community. Next we have Evan Schloss. Evan Schloss, there we go. He is a white, queer, male, privileged, gender fluid, licensed marriage and family therapist and professional clinic counselor. Uh, he's been working in the field of mental health for 18, year, 18 years and has overseen mental health services at College of Alameda for the past five years. Next we have Carolina Martinez. There we go. Uh, she's one of the founders of the Undocumented Community Resource Center uh, she was born and raised in Mexico, and she moved to the United States 10 years ago with the dream of securing a better future for herself and family. She believes that every person has the right to the same opportunities and expresses her Mexican roots through folk dancing and is proud to say dance is a most powerful form of expression. Uh, next, we have Mari Maria Pinon. There we go. And she's a second year student here at BCC. Hey, second years. Uh, she was born in Mexico, but lived most of her life um, in a town called Linden uh, here in California. She's a student ambassador and has been working for the um, Undocumented Resource Center since August of this year. She wants to transfer to UC Berkeley to major in sociology, and she wants to finish her education so that she can continue supporting herself and her family uh, financially. Okay, did I get everybody? Did I miss anyone else? Then there's me. 
No, no, I'm kidding, <laughs> I'm kidding, not me. Uh, so the person who will be leading this panel is uh, Sir Jason Seals. He serves as department chair of ethnic studies and professor of African American studies at Merritt College. He's committed to social justice, so he carries on the tradition of activist intellectual. Like, you got that right, activist intellectual. Um, he uses his knowledge and experience to address critical social issues to empower individuals, not only for personal change, but for social change. So without further ado, I take myself out of the way and I give you Mr. Jason Seals. Make him welcome. Give thanks. Give thanks to everyone that is here. Give thanks for our MC of the day. Could you clap it up for our MC? Just letting people kind of trickle down. Um, once again, I am Jason Seals. It's an honor to be here um, to talk about something that is so dear to my heart, which is healing. I think um, we are in spaces a lot nowadays talking about concepts of healing and justice. And I think it's important to acknowledge as a person of African ancestry, my ancestors come from a place of resistance and fighting because of the social toxicity that has manifested itself in historical oppression and racism. And I think we're in a day and age where we're seeing more people wanting to galvanize around social issues that are harmful and toxic. And I think we're, we're beginning to recognize that there are barriers that are hindering how we're getting to that place of healing. And I feel like we have to get to um, some alignment in terms of values, in terms of spaces that are safe so everyone can have equitable lives. And it's gonna come through our work. And so solidarity is important. So this day, and which has been formulated by Janine and, and the people that organize it is very, very poignant because it is needed. And so we want to give thanks for everyone that has been present today, that's been a part of this learning and part of the planning, because much of the work that's needed is not going to come through this panel, but it's going to come what you all do once you all leave here. So give thanks for you all being here. Clap it up for yourselves. So I will say that in my work, um, I've been doing youth development, social justice, education work for about 20 years um, in Oakland, New York. And I think one of the things that I've seen is um, a lot of pain. And the pain that I've seen um, has been representative in ways in which I feel like we can't recognize all the time. But one of the things that I was actually speaking about earlier this week was depression. And I was speaking about it in some classrooms because I've been noticing how um, there are some typical ways in which we understand depression to manifest itself. We look for certain common symptoms. But a lot of times, it's showing up very differently in our communities. And people are learning how to function in very, very high ways and disguising it in ways in which we can't recognize it. And people are carrying so much. And so um, earlier when our keynote was speaking, she brought up the usage of marijuana. And I think a lot of times the young people that I'm working with, some of our students at the, at the Peralta system are often masking what they're holding. And they're masking it through substance abuse, through uh, marijuana, through drugs. And I think we have to create safe spaces for people to actually receive what they need. And it might not come through traditional practices, um, and it might not necessarily come through the spaces that we acknowledge as being those historic spaces. And so even identifying newer spaces is gonna be helpful in this process. I was bringing up how historically in the black community it was the church, or it was the salon, or it was the barbershop. And so there is these spaces that we have to reclaim and re-identify as healing spaces outside of traditional therapy because therapy in itself has created an idea in our head of what healing should look like. But that's the word that was given to us. Wellness is something that we've always focused on and it shouldn't have to happen in a constructed space. The space should be constructed by the people that are enduring the atrocities 
what do they need, how do they claim it, and how do they identify it. And so that's the hope that we're going to do today in terms of speaking to the panel and allowing the panel to give us some, some of their expertise and some of their knowledge. And so what I'm going to try to do, because in panels it's always very difficult, is try to make sure there's some equity up here. Right, and try to make sure that everyone doesn't have to answer every question, and then leave room for you all to ask some to ask some important questions. So, um, I think what I would love to do, though, before we get started, is can we all stand up one time, just one time? Everybody, stand up really quickly. <coughs> so, when I recognize resistance, resistance has come through organizing through chants and songs. And so I want you all to repeat after me. I am, I am somebody, somebody. I, won't be I won't be stopped by nobody. By nobody. I got my fist in the air. I got, air. I got moving my feet. I got love for my people, but it starts with me. I am, I am somebody. somebody. All right. So I want to start off with this mental health question of um, how, does sh how does mental wellness or mental health show up in our communities? Um, and so I want to put that out there, giving folks an opportunity to kind of define or provide a picture of what you're seeing in your communities. And so I would like to start um, with Paul. Um, in terms of Paul doing some work with Cop Watch, if you can tell us what you're seeing, um, I think that would be helpful. I do work with Cop Watch. I also do uh, civic work through the uh, Mental Health Commission, and I work uh, directly with the homeless. I also am a media producer and primarily interested in content. So what do I see going on out there? 35% of calls coming into the Berkeley police are mental health uh, connected, 35%. We have a population out there within the homeless and the underprivileged uh, that is constantly growing. The fastest growing demographic is amongst youth and the elderly. They're, they're growing at very rapid rates. The system as a whole is being under, underutilized and overwhelmed. You can step out of this building and walk up and down Shattuck Avenue, as I do each and every day, and see at least three or four people in severe need of mental health attention, severe. Before I got here, there was a fellow standing on the corner with a lighter in his hand, just holding it. And what can we do about that? Frankly, it's not about money. In the positions that I sit in, that's what I always hear. Well, if we only had more money, if we only had more money, if they would only budget for this. That is not the answer. We've proven that over and over and over again, that it isn't the money, because we have thrown money at the issues, and we're still in the same shape that we're in. The answer lies in each and every one of us, and that's part of why I'm here representing Cop Watch. This is a community and a societal issue. We need more meetings just like we're having right now, and we need more understanding of mental health. We all do. Regarding Berkeley, we need citizens who have been trained to work around mental health issues. This doesn't mean that they're therapists, but it means that they aren't police. It means that they're not there with guns in their hands trying to solve mental health issues. This means that they are, you're not being hospitalized because you're standing on a corner with a lighter in your hand. We all need a better understanding of mental health. Mental health is one of the most highly stigmatized highly stigmatized conditions that we meet as, as citizens. So the answer, again, is not more money. 
The answer is right here, all of you, all of the people out there, everyone in your community needs to understand more and more about mental health. That will help. When we call for a first responder, we don't wanna call the police. We wanna call people that are close to you who can help you. We're not gonna get that unless they start training within the community. We're not gonna get it. It is not the money. Don't have professionals or your city say it's the money. It is not the money. It is a will to go ahead and train and share. And I could go on and on and in fact often do, but I'm not going to this morning because we've got a long line of people. Thank you very much. Thank you, Paul. Um, can I have um, Dr. Brown, can you give us um, some insight um, as um, an administrator that works within the district? What are you seeing um, in terms of mental health? What we're seeing, health services uh, district-wide is, is currently under my area um, at the district, you know, servicing the four colleges. And um, in the first year in this position, the health services um, lead faculty, including Evan sitting next to me, um, including the surveys that we had, including the anecdotal just human experience that we see, including my 17 years in the classroom, it was very clear that mental health issues were the number one issues facing our students. And the reason that we knew this was because the mental health services that we offer were all impacted it would take a student at least 30 days before they could see one of our mental health counselors unless uh, they were um, expressing, you know, really serious, really serious issues. Um, and so it's the issues of depression, like Brother Seals mentioned, it's the issues of stress, anxiety, um, um, issues in our background and our childhood experiences that are now coming into the forefront of our minds and our psyches. Um, and so, um, we saw it as a really critical issue, the whole entire team, um, and we got together to address that issue. We wrote a grant, we didn't receive that grant, but we continued to work together to, um, to find the funds, pull the funds so that we could expand our mental health services, and I'm really happy that within a year's time we've been able to do that and it's continuing to expand right now. Um, as an as a educator in the classroom, because I'm not a trained mental health worker, um, Year after year, semester after semester, thousands and thousands of students have come in and through um, my classroom and, and we've be, been able to experience each other. And um, I am one of the many faculty in this district that, that works to really connect with students, you know? And um, time and time again, the conversation was about two things. It was either mental health or physical health. The mental health of the student themselves coming into um, office hours talking about I just want to kill myself. Um, I don't know how to deal with the domestic violence and the depression and what's happening with me, um, or physical health or mental health, but mostly physical for um, a loved one that they were caring for. And this is especially for, uh, my students were predominantly African-American students um, who were expressing you know, the family uh, responsibilities and the family love and care and the weight of what it means to be a student and all the time it takes to be a student and yet um, be this, this family leader, you know, assisting people who are mentally ill or physically ill um, at home. So we know that we're, we're in a crisis. Um, I really appreciate what Paul just said about, well, a few things that he said. One, calling the police is not a solution. Um, it's actually a problem for black and brown people particularly and black and brown males in particular. Um, it's not a solution for our teachers as well who have not been well trained, many of them, and want to call security or police on students who are experiencing a great deals of stress that, that might come out and look like anger, you know, or look like something that from your own cultural lens and your own privileged position cannot understand and read correctly, and you want to dial the police and cause more, you know, more trauma to the student. Um, I agree with that entirely, and I also agree with, with, with what Paul expressed, that it's really, it's really upon all of us. You know, we're in a time where 
I mean, it's just, it's, it's what we think as, as mentally ill, oftentimes I think that it's us that's mentally ill in this, in this sense that we tend to normalize things. And right now it seems like we are normalizing the high level of, of, of housing insecurity, the fact that um, it's very racialized and gender gendered. Um, I think that we're normalizing and driving by and walking past the fact that it's right in our faces. Mm -hmm. And it's ironic that, and it's dangerous actually, that as the homeless uh, camps are growing and growing and growing at the same time that we see these mass condo developments growing and growing and growing, that there isn't this, this major turnover revolutionary level of protest and commitment that's happening because you can't say you don't know. It's just like with Black Lives Matters, um, you cannot now say that you don't know what the police do in the African American community because you saw it on video. So we have to check ourselves in terms of what we think is mental well-being sometimes as opposed to who we think of as mentally ill. I think sometimes the level of conformity that we take on is, is a serious level of mental illness. From an African perspective, it is not acceptable that I have housing and food and you do not. I am because we are. That means if I have that I must, I must share, not a must like, oh, I gotta go do this, but it's, this is a natural part of culture. What we're seeing here is a reflection of another person's cultural heritage, a capitalistic, European, Eurocentric, hegemonic de de designed idea of what social space should look like. And we are all, regardless of race and color, tending to conform to that. And so I ask us, just like Paul said, to think about what is everyone's role in this? It's not just the mental health providers. It's not just the teachers or the mental health staff that we have that are tirelessly working with weightless out the door. It's all of our responsibility. Thank you, Dr. Brown. So I want to bring a student's voice into this conversation. And so Marie, I'm going to ask you if you can, um, could you shed some light in terms of what do you think students need? So as a student, um, I can definitely identify with a lot of the things that you mentioned that a lot of students go through. I live um, in the co-ops here in Berkeley, so I see a lot of students from UC Berkeley that often deal with a lot of stress from not just classes, but um, most of them have jobs and they have to like pay their rent and they have to help their families. Um, and also their like background has a lot to do with it as well. Um, I know that I was born in Mexico. My family was born and raised in Mexico and they're very different um, from the families that were that have lived here in America. Um, in my family, mental health and mental illness is not an issue. It's fake. It doesn't happen to anybody. You just have to get over it. And I know it's like that for a lot of people. And so often students don't really know how to deal with, like, they know that the resources are there for them, but it's just very difficult to take that first step when your entire life you've, you know, only heard that you just need to get over it, that, you know, you have to be better at just being a person and you can't have any help. And it's very difficult to go from listening to that your entire life and then somebody, you know, tells you that you can get help and, and you want to. Um, so I definitely think that seeing more events like this and just having, you know, um, maybe workshops, support from like faculty, like just reassuring people that it's okay to, get help is a big, big help. <laughs> this is very difficult to like talk about, so I apologize. Um, You're doing fine, <laughs> you're doing fine. But you're doing fine. thank you guys so much. Um, yeah, I think that that is something that is not often talked about, the fact that a lot of people do know that resources are there and that they can't, but they just, they can't bring themselves to do it because it's something that is not you know, taught. It's not something that's often talked about. So, yeah, um, that's what I have to say. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. So, so to follow up what Maria brought up, um, I want to bring it to Evan 
I want to get your voice um, as someone that is in service of our students on campus. Um, how do we deal with um, some of the issues our students are dealing with in a proactive manner um, rather than at the point in which it's too late? How do instructors, how do community partners, administrators offer support um, in a preventative manner? That's a great question because uh, so much of the people that come to see us, it is after the fact that they're already really stressed out. Just this week I had four people that have, were actively feeling suicidal that I had to help support. So yeah, ideally the more that we can do to be preventative is, is, would be great. Um, if you have instructors, if you're out there, um, take the time to support your students, to let them know that you care, to let them know that they matter. Um, to ha hopefully understand that the students have a lot of different things going on in their lives. And be a, just make accommodations if you can, uh, be there, be accessible if you can, and take time to support them. Uh, I, I think uh, Siri did a great job kind of explaining, culturally I think our culture is sick. Our culture is the thing that is failing us. Um, the U.S. culture does not encourage families to support each other. It, it, everyone is isolated. Everyone is, the mentality is do what you can to support yourself. So I think preventatively, we need to be out there discussing these things, discussing and breaking the stigma that's going around uh, about how difficult it is to ask for help. This needs to be, asking for help and being vulnerable should be seen as a sign of bravery. To, to really be who you are is a really brave act. Um, but our society doesn't want you to think that, you know, it wants you to be tough. It wants you to be able to endure. So what I encourage proactively is to reach out to the people that you care about, especially in these times, the last few years have been really hard. Um, I know it's always been hard as I'm not trying to just say like, oh, Trump made everything terrible. It's been bad. Mm -hmm. It's been bad, but it just got worse. Uh, and so the challenge is when we are all stressed, what I'm seeing is there's more division and there's more, I gotta protect my own. And what we really need in these times is to be reaching out and to connect with the other people that we care about. And this is the time to be there, to ask people how they're doing, to not just accept uh, that they're surviving is good enough, to let people know that you care about them. Um, from administrators, we need to be doing, you know, doing things to be proactive, to name, like hold events like this, to name what's going on. Uh, when I go out to classes, so before I even see people, I want to name that 50% of college students are experiencing depression to the point where it, it negatively impacts their school. 50% of college students are experiencing anxiety to the point where it's negatively impacting their school. Uh, suicide is the second leading cause of death for college students second leading cause of death, and that to me is unacceptable and ridiculous that we, that that's even anywhere up in the top. We need to be able to be there to support each other in whatever way we can, and just naming these things and saying, I'm here, I care about you, you have value, whoever you are, whatever it is, whatever your abilities are, whoever you're coming from, you are still a person, you have value and you're important. And to be able to, to name that and tell everyone that you know that, because right now I just see people are just getting more and more stressed out. Mm -hmm. So this is the time to let people know that you care. Really quick follow-up. Um, I think sometimes we're looking for abnormal behavior. What do we do in cases where people are still showing up um, in a very normal way? So for instance, um, some people that are depressed um, are very high functioning. So they're still going to work, still taking care of normal activities. Like, how do we begin to be present for people that might be showing no symptoms? I think still, you know, saying that you care about someone and asking a deep <coughs> question beyond just, how are you, I'm good, that's it. But recognizing that everyone is going through some level of stress right now and trying to take the extra minute to really actually get to know people and know what's going on. Um, you're absolutely right. Uh, so many people out there are functional and we don't know that they're hurting. Um, and just to name that, 
just to make that clear that like we all need support. Uh, that's why right at the top of the, the resources that I give out, it says everyone needs support. Mm -hmm. Everyone deserves support. Um, and making sure that you are encouraging people to do whatever they need to take care of themselves. Uh, my, one of my favorite quotes that I give out to everyone that I can is the Audre Lorde quote about self-care. I don't know if you all know this one. Uh, caring for myself is not self-indulgence. It's self-preservation, and that in itself is an act of political warfare. Mm. So for, for me, just being there, if you know someone that is experiencing anything, any stress, any marginalization, know that just surviving is a form of political resistance. It is powerful. One of the most powerful things that you can do as a person is to say, I have value, my life is worth living, I deserve to be treated with respect and I deserve support. Um, and to say that to the other people around you, even if they seem like they're doing fine, to let people know that we need to step up and be there for each other. Sorry to take up so much time. No, thank you. Carolina, can I get you to talk about some of the services that you offer here and, and how you try to provide a net of support for students? Um. I am, hi, my name is Carolina and I am, I coordinate the Undocument Community Resource Center and I, own, I am also the founder. And what I, what I, what we do is try to support the students because we all know that the Undocument community is going through really hard time with this administration. So we have a lot of the students that come with anxiety, we come with uh, because this social, um, this administration is doing really, like, we're having a really hard time with our community, and we try to send the students with, with the mental health. We also try to help them as much as we can with financial help, and because a lot of, a lot of, of, of our students, when you're undocumented, they become homeless like really fast. They don't. They don't. Um, they they don't have a social security number, so they cannot have a, the rent. So we try to put the students in co-ops. We try to to find emergency funds for them as well. And and as a Mexican, I can say as as a background being undocumented. Um, we don't treat ourselves. We always gonna struggle even now that I'm in process of residency. It's, it's really hard to get over that. I'm always gonna be undocumented. I just went to Mexico and I had like really hard time it, with aduana like going through there and I, and I thought I was gonna, they're not gonna let me in. So we, we deal with that. We constantly deal with that and we need more awareness for the undocumented community, and we need more a, a person that that looks like us and have the background. And because is because we don't if we don't have someone like 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 look like us, they're not gonna understand what we're going through. That's what we miss it. I think we miss it in our program and. And that's, that's what um, we should focus, right now we should focus in programs like this. Programs like this that really bring awareness in, in the community and feel included. Thank, Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So, so Zaya, could you talk about what is the um, the intersection between social justice and mental health. Thank you, this is my favorite thing to talk about. <laughs> um, from where I sit as a pediatrician that has worked in safety net settings for a long time, um, I see a mismatch between um, the issues in black and brown communities and the help that's being offered. Um, what I see a lot of is um, people calling um, what people call depression, I see as valid despair. 
And um, I, I struggle sometimes with the idea that we're going to offer people um, meditation resources when they're dealing with food insecurity, right? Like that to me feels like a real mismatch. And I don't totally understand um, how people are supposed to recover from despair uh, when we're just offering them some alone time in a room with somebody who's probably not from their community to talk. Um, I see so many of my patients um, who have what I would describe as righteous anger in their work in school settings being diagnosed with things like oppositional defiant disorder and ADHD uh, when in fact they're mad for valid reasons and it is super hard to focus when you got harassed on your way to school by cops in a really unjustified way. And so I think that there is a really important need for mental health providers, in particular those who want to work in the black and brown communities, to recognize structural inequities as a major source of mental health challenges. And if we recognize that, then it's clear that the solution is not necessarily more office space for more mental health providers, but rather all of us working in solidarity to change some of the structures that are producing some of these disparities in mental health outcomes. Um, I think similarly, uh, a lot of times we talk about cultural competency, uh, but that, that, that is not an adequate replacement for actually having people from the same communities that are dealing with these struggles. And I don't care if people might have learned about my community's food ways if they're not understanding my, my community's food deserts, you know? And so again, to be culturally competent to me means to be politically active because if you clearly see what is facing black and brown communities, there's only one appropriate response. And so I think it's really important that we continue to think about these things in terms of individual level mental health services and, and developing more robust responses, but it can't be to the exclusion of a more political response because that's the only way that we're actually going to see change. Um, so follow up, you said a more of a political response. Can you expound on that just a little bit more? Absolutely. So I think that there's a role for every single person. Uh, for people who are workers in mental health settings, it's really important that uh, everybody who works in mental health settings thinks about hiring and who gets hired to do these jobs and how they can influence it. So often people say, oh, we were not able to hire people from this community because we couldn't find those people. But that's just madness to me because this is an increasingly diverse country and state. Um, and so it's really just an F issue of prioritization and effort. So that is one thing. But I also think it's important for all of us um, to recognize the, the power that we can potentially have. Any, any individual can go and testify um, or make an appointment with their political representatives. And if you are a person of color who is working in this field or experiencing these issues, it might be really important for policymakers to be able to hear from you, hear your perspective, and most importantly, hear what you think the solution is. Because if the solution is not more money for more programs to have people not of that community servicing that community, Community. If that's not the solution, then we need to help policymakers figure it out, because I promise you, they don't know. Um, and so we can write letters to the editor, we can write op-eds, we can try and get interviewed whenever media reporters, because people don't realize this, but policymakers are not reading academic journals. They're, <laughs> they're not. What they're reading is the popular press, and so every time we insert an anti-racist perspective into the popular press, then we're helping to move things forward politically. Of course, we all need to vote, but we don't just need to vote. We need to talk to all of our clients about the importance of voting because that level of political empowering um, can really help with one's sense of well-being and mental well-being. Um, and then I just think that all of us need to recognize our role in this, and this work doesn't ever go away. Some people are from communities that are privileged enough to to step in and out of anti-racist work when it's convenient for them. And those people need to recognize that, again, there is a certain level of authenticity that is required if you're going to work in these communities. And what that authenticity requires of those of us who are privileged because of the way how we look to step in and out of the work is that we stay in. And furthermore, we actually leverage our own privilege. So I myself identify as African American, but I have an incredible education that I've been really lucky to receive. I'm light skinned and I speak in this very educated way. And for these reasons, I'm included at tables that some of my patients are not included at. And I have an obligation, even though it might make me uncomfortable, to speak at every single table that I'm at on this issue of anti-racism and make sure that anti-racism is always part of the conversation. So from hiring to voting to participating in media to just making sure that anti-racism is part of the conversation and leveraging your privilege, these are all things that people can do to be politically engaged around these important issues. Thank you.
So Daisy, I wanted to make sure I brought you in this conversation and make sure. Yeah, 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 de definitely. So <laughs> exactly, exactly. <laughs> so I wanted to get um, just you to kind of also expound on like this intersection between mental health um, and social justice and maybe the role that that plays in terms of healing. Well, we know we have the social determinants of health, which is a bit watered down. And the social determinants of health say that um, your education, your um, location, um, your socioeconomic status, that's what influences your health. But we know that policy drives all of those things as well. So as Zaya was saying, who definitely brought us to church, I was like lighting up over here. I was like, yes. <laughs> Um, I think something that we also need to understand for these different policymakers, some of them do know, actively know what's happening and what they're doing, and they've been held accountable in many ways and put on blast, et cetera. They have to understand that what they are doing is they are basically, when they pass poor policies that promote more poor health outcomes and mental health outcomes in our community, they're basically promoting a slow genocide. That's actually what's happening. And in our community, I, someone posted um, a quote that was really powerful, and it says, mental illness is taught these days, not inherited, and that is so true. And when some of the times when I go out into the community, um, I, I really just pay attention to the way in which we're engaging with each other and some of the ways in which I see, even within the social justice movement, how we kind of sacrifice our mental health and whatnot for the movement, yeah, but at the other time too, how are we bringing in like this culture of self-care, right, into the social justice movement? And I did, I think that this question, like Zay already answered it, so I'm just going to kind of go off on my own what I wanted to discuss, but I think... I think what needs to really be brought into the conversation is decolonization as a primary factor because I, I see we have talk therapy, psychotropic drugs, we try to pass these budgets and policy from our programming, but they are all still within that um, white male patriarchal framework and that's not helping our folks. And then we put our folks within there, uh, within that system and then they just start to assimilate, right? Um, and I think basically what I really want to start seeing is I want to start seeing drumming circles. I want to start seeing herbalism. I want to see nutrition talked about in its regard to mental health. There's a reason why we have food deserts in our community because if I'm always feeding you hot Cheetos and a cup of noodles and that's killing off all the enzymes and the good bacteria in your stomach, of course you're going to have poor mental health because most of our gut receptors are in our stomach. That's a whole other conversation, right? Um, I'm kind of a little bit of a conspiracy theorist. I think everything's planned. But I also think um, in, in if we really want to have a real social justice movement for mental health in our communities, it really has to start with when we're talking about systems of oppression, it's not what's wrong with people of color because we've had that conversation. We know there's dozens and dozens of articles and research and documentaries. I want to start talking to the oppressor. What's wrong with you? Because, oh, you see, right? Because that, that opens up a whole other conversation and now it's like, oh, wait, me? Yeah, you, so what's going on with you? Because obviously you think that this is okay, and it's not. And Paulo Freire says when you dehumanize other people, you dehumanize yourself. And we have to really get actively engaged in under deeper understanding of what we're really dealing with, especially with this presidency, because it's only gonna get worse. And there's people who are even working in Berkeley, in Oakland, San Francisco, these quote unquote liberal spaces, and they have the most deeply entrenched racist views upon our folks. It really also needs to start within these local county departments. I'm on the Public Health Commission, and I also used to work within Department of Public Health San Francisco. That's how I really got started. And I would see this with my own eyes, mismanagement of funds, nepotism and money just actually really disappearing at the end of the day as well, right? Um, so what happened to that $400,000 in San Francisco to train the police on how to work with youth of color? Mm -hmm. oh, oh, right? So it needs to really start there. How are we holding people accountable for using budgets properly? How are we holding people accountable for bringing in these decolonized programs? Because it scares people, right? Because it's, it's a whole new level of... Um, um, healing that you have to do in order to understand why this is necessary. And now they have things like mindful science, but mindfulness and meditation, but some of those things, is it's the new age movement. Oh, just meditate and you're gonna be happy. Don't be angry, et cetera, et cetera. Okay, guess what? My cousin just got shot. I just got evicted. My baby daddy's acting crazy. I don't wanna meditate, I wanna fight, okay? And that's okay, you can do that, but how do we help you channel that in a constructive way? And when I see um, some of the stuff that goes on in our communities, like the new age mental health, um, I want to say new age, what is this new cycle that I'm seeing amongst our, my generation specifically? It's this music that we're listening to. And like I said, mental illness is taught, not is learned, it's taught, not inherited in many cases. So if we just came from Isley Brothers, Earth, Wind and & Fire, and now we got 
um, I call my gun KKK because it hates N-I-G-G-A's. That's a real song, right? That 21 Savage, that's a real song. How do we get there? Who's promoting that? Who's making money off of that, right? Another part that we have to talk is what is the political economy behind mental illness? Because people are making money at every single point in turn. They're making money off of this homelessness issue, believe it or not. They're making money off of us being in jail. They're making money off of us horizontal violence towards each other. They're making money off of us assimilating. They're banking on it. And I think one tool that we have to flip the script is social media. And I think the powers that be, they weren't banking on social media being this much, this powerful of an influence. Hence why there's lack of access in certain communities to the internet and so on and so forth and surveillance and so on and so forth. Um, so I just hope as we continue to move into the future, we really start to understand that we can't have a powerful mental health movement unless we talk about decolonization first and foremost. Right? And in order for us to really understand what that decolonization looks like, we're gonna kind of have to go do the same code for. We have to go back and see. I'm not saying that we have to go all the way back and start living like our ancestors did because there's some things too that were happening that were not conducive to our overall well-being and growth. But what I am saying is there are powerful practices, um, uh, systems of engagement, ways of healing that can be really powerful for us in the now. And the funny thing is, it's demonized amongst us as people of color, but you go. We're in Berkeley, right? So I can just go down up to the street to any of one of these shops and we see a whole bunch of white folks in there playing with these different practices that our ancestors really died to preserve. And then we're here like, oh, I'm gonna go to church. That's another thing too. Okay. Some people, some, I'm gonna stop, bro. I'm gonna, I'm gonna wrap it in. But I think an, another, I, I, I will say this. I think the church is also a, a major contributor for mental health. And I saw a meme and it was like Jesus knocking on the door and it's like, excuse me, I need you to stop. I'm saying that I'm about to come and heal you. I need you to go to the doctor and go see a therapist, right? And I think the church does have um, a real pull within the black and brown community. And what the church needs to do is really reintroduce these practices and really reintroduce mental health, not in an old pray, pray it away, but in a way that's like really tangible because faith without works is dead. So who am I praying to if I'm not actively doing the work to heal myself? Yeah. Yeah, thanks. <laughs> Give thanks. Um, I think it's really important that we do acknowledge um, systems and how systems harm. Um, but I also want to acknowledge that those systems were created by people. And I want us to begin to talk about, and I want to pose some questions um, to the panel that makes us think about how do we contribute and how do we shift how the systems are working against us? Because these systems are operated by people. Um, it, it, in one, of my, in one of my classes, I have students do this. I have them write down t top 10 personal values. And I'm really trying to help them look at like what's most important to them. And what I always tell people is that if you look at your values, your values in general aren't negative. Most people's uh, values are positive. The question is, are they inclusive? And if they're not inclusive, then how are you creating environments where people will be harmed? And so that's where I want to kind of shift it, and, and I want to get people to kind of chime in on what, what do educators need? What do practitioners need? What do administrators need in terms of training, in terms of skill set, to be able to provide equitable, safe, nurturing environments as a solution to the harms, right? So Dr. Brown, um, you were in the classroom for years. I want to start off with you. Okay, I, I said I knew he's gonna say my name first. Um, I, I, I'm a nationalist, I'm a black nationalist. And, um, and so when I'm asked how can we transform the current institutions, I say it's not possible. Exactly. Because again, Audre Lorde even said, you know, it's the way the house was built. Now, for, for our people, who have been pushing and fighting and burning down and pleading and singing and praying to change this system for now what is 500 years to ask what can we do to change that system? I say we have done everything that we can. Mm -hmm. And so what we need is our own institutions with healers from our own backgrounds and cultural understanding we need our own mental health system. We need our own educational system. The systems of the society, like Sister said here, 
They create mental illness for us. Because I go from one reality in my home where I'm validated culturally, psychologically. I could come from a very healthy family, which we have many. The majority of black families are healthy. And then I'm sent at five years old into a system that begins to devalidate and dehumanize my very existence from a cultural frame of reference. I'm told that I don't talk right. I'm told that I don't move right. I'm told to sit down and hold still when my melanin tells me something else. The system itself is built to destroy who we are. And that's not new. That's what they brought us into. So uh, to me, it's too late. We need our own. Our own healers, our own community centers, our own mental health centers and specialists. And that's really the only way that it can happen. While we currently continue to exist, within the structure that we have not defined, then we have to do everything we can to bring the right-minded people from our community into those systems. I wanna hire her to be the mental health counselor. I want her to come in. I want her to come in for her people. Because as much empathy that I have for the Latino undocumented experience, it's not my experience. So step aside and let the right people come in to do the healing within these institutions. But it's very difficult for the providers who are white, privileged by all those means that you know, to put themselves second or third. It's actually, I'm being nice when I'm saying it's difficult. <laughs> it's very difficult for them to make themselves uncomfortable by hiring someone who seems angry when it's actually a righteous anger. I'm an angry black woman, I'm hella pissed off for all the right reasons. So my reaction that isn't anger, but you think is anger and you wanna, you know, the way that they do us, that's you, that's you. And you cannot heal me. That's my answer. So Dr. Brown, <laughs> so. <laughs> Dr. Brown, I'm gonna push you a little bit because I think it's important that we do need folks of the same ethnicity and background to support people as they are going through experiences and harms. But it would also be, I think it would be harmful to say that just because you are of the same background that you know how to do that work. And so I, I wanna ask you, what do people need? So if I am a black man or a black woman and I'm working with black youth, like how do I show up for them rather than just showing up in my ethnicity? That's why I said the right-minded people. I said the right-minded people. You could be somebody who's right-minded from another community, but that is not nearly enough nor effective enough as the right-minded people. And when I say right-minded, there is a lot to that. I mean someone who is, who is African-centered. I don't mean a dashiki and a head wrap. <laughs> I mean, African-centered, someone who has worked on their own colonization down to the level that they have eradicated it from themselves and then do like, Audre Lorde keeps coming up again in my mind because he brought her up. She said that every black person, every black woman, every black lesbian woman every, has a little white man in the back of their head. I want somebody who's constantly checking that and is part of a village of other healers and leaders who are also checking you on that. So it may sound simplistic for people to people when, when I'm saying it needs to be us to heal us, but there is nobody else who can do it. So what, what do we do within that framework then? What do we do within that framework? We have to get ourselves busy so that we can heal ourselves, make sure we have the properly prepared people to heal our people, make sure we have the properly prepared people to teach our people, and then we can be on a different track. I'm tired after 500 years and when I say I, I don't mean Siri. I mean all the ancestors and foremothers and forefathers whose shoulders I stand upon. Right. We've been pushing, we've been begging, we've been praying, we've been crying, we've been asking, we've been pleading, we did it nice, we did it mean, we did it violent, we did it unviolent, we do, we've done everything. Now let's go back to what the Panthers were talking about, Nat Turner was talking about, Harry Tubman was talking about, the National Association of Color Women was talking about, W.E. Du Bois and Marcus Garvey were talking about, that it will take us to save us, period. And that doesn't mean that we don't work side by side with it's gonna take them to save them. 
and we support that. That's just my version of it. Someone else can come with a multicultural lens that sounds really good. It's just not Siri. It's not Siri. Because I've studied it, and I've studied it, and I've seen it, and I've seen it, and, and it's just, it doesn't seem to be working, does it? Give thanks. So there's got to be something else. Give thanks. So I want to go back to Zaya. You were speaking of, um, you said, uh, valid despair in righteous anger. And how do we prepare people with the right worldview and tools to be able to recognize that um, and support that without stigmatizing and harming someone? Um, because I think there's often um, a pathologizing of someone's circumstances and we never get beyond whatever we've diagnosed them to be. Uh, thank you. Uh, so I think that one really important training is just around context. Something that I'm working on at the Department of Public Health is um, I have a lecture about the origins of black poverty and I really start 400 years ago and explain like century by century the racist policies that have created the things that we're seeing in the black community now and it is surprising. I'm a physician and I often give this talk to other physicians and in the room we have all these people with graduate degrees and yet this history that I'm presenting is news to most of the people because of the ways that we do education. And so as far as training, I think that one really important thing is just giving people some context. I find that a number of my uh, professional colleagues have no idea why so many Central Americans are immigrating to this country, right? Uh, but there's a lot of problematic um, understandings or assumptions about why that might be the case. I find that the majority of my colleagues have no idea the levels of despair and deprivation African Americans are facing. Most people are surprised to learn that the median salary in the Bay Area of black people people is $46,000 a year. Most people are surprised to learn that San Francisco has the second highest rate of black unemployment in the nation. Most people are surprised to learn that San Francisco has the worst African American achievement levels in the state, despite the fact that we have an $11.2 billion budget a year. And so I think training people on some of these contextual issues can help them understand and make sense of why people might be feeling anger and despair. But training is not enough, and that's often where we leave it. Also, there's a really important piece around accountability. So often we train people and then we hope that that training is going to lead to behavior change and it doesn't. And so another really important step that institutions need to take is to create a system of accountability in particular for their providers to ensure that they are delivering the quality of care that they're supposed to be delivering to be gathering their paycheck. What that looks like to me in very specific terms is creating a set of process measures. So for example, uh, one of the struggles that we have in the Department of Public Health where I work is that we have these home visiting programs programs with nurses, and we didn't have the same level of excellent outcomes among African Americans that we have with other people as a result of this home visiting. When we actually started to look at it, we developed a set of process measures. How long between the referral um, and the first phone call is happening by race? How many phone calls and visits does that client get? by race. How likely is that client to drop out of the program by race? And when we started to stratify some of these performance measures by race, it paints a really clear picture of the ways in which our public health nurses are falling short, specifically with black folks. And so I think it's about training around context, but we have to train and then we have to hold people accountability. Also, in one division of the Department of Public Health, they have introduced it that on your annual performance evaluation, they check out to see how many equity trainings you have attended that year. And that's an actual factor that has material Real consequences for the employees in that division. So what does it look like to set up systems that actually hold people who are not usually used to being held accountable around their racism? How do we hold those people accountable to behave appropriately? Thank you. Thank you. Mm -hmm.